fall, I befriended a photographer at the Boston Harbor during Marine Ecology's Whale Watch. I thought his name was Frankel, but my friends still tell me that it was probably Frank Lynn. I like Frankel better, though. He was a bit of a strange man, and we all found him to be quite annoying when he was taking our picture, but that didn't stop me from trying to negotiate the price of our photos after the Whale Watch. I ended up getting them for free, which is another story. The point of this one is what Frankel and I ended up talking about. While we were arguing, Frankel mentioned how much he hated his job. And being annoyed with his insistence that I pay all $25, I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I asked him what he wanted to do, as in job-wise. He told me, well, right now, I really just want to die. That made me take a step back. And I told him that I had been there and that I had faith that everything would work out for him. He told me he didn't know where else he could work, so I told him to think about his passions or how he might spend his days if he didn't work with the photo people by the harbor. By then, though, it was time for us to go. As we were walking down to the bus, I spotted Frankel sitting in a chair by the photo tent, and I raised my voice a little bit, and I said, hey, I hope you figure everything out. He stood up and walked over to me and said, can I give you a hug? I was pretty weirded out, as was my teacher, Miss Wilds, but I said, you know what, sure. So he hugged me, he asked for my name, I said good luck with everything, and that was the end of that. At this moment, you might be confused as to why I'm telling you this very odd story. Here's my reasoning. If I can make even just a small difference in Franco's life, I hope that I can help more people too. I also thought about how I eventually treated him with sincere respect, even though I thought he was quite irritating. Everyone deserves grace, no matter how you feel about them. The chances are they're going through something themselves, just like Frankel was. So here I stand today in front of many people, and I bet there's at least one person who might feel how Frankel felt, or at least knows someone who was struggling like that. Hopefully, some of the things I tell you about my personal experiences today will help you approach your struggles a little bit differently. Like Frankel, I felt completely stuck with no idea what to do about it. I'm new to Beaver this year, coming in as a junior. Moving schools was extremely challenging for me for many reasons. I'd been at my old school since fifth grade. My mom and my aunt went there. I thought that's where I was supposed to be, and that if I made it through middle school and half of high school, that I could just finish it out and graduate like I always thought I would. Spoiler alert, that did not happen. I had considered switching schools many times, but I felt like I couldn't. That school had become a big, big part of my life, more than school should, in my opinion. And it took some really awful things and a lot of growth to finally get me to switch. Anorexia took over my life to the point where I was admitted to the hospital the summer after my sophomore year. And even after going through all of that, I returned to that school in the fall. I knew it was a bad idea, and I, but I couldn't stand to miss more school, and I couldn't even imagine the idea of having to repeat. Another spoiler alert, both of those things happened. Everyone I know who goes to my old school is pretty miserable. And so was I back in the day. I was so miserable that I tried to take my own life in the school bathroom. Of course, school wasn't all to blame. I had many other deeper rooted issues that were affecting me at the time, but I won't deny that school played a role. It was a toxic environment and my friends were really just friends. That was Valentine's Day, 2022, and I ended up spending five months in two different hospitals. The first few months were agonizing, but when I started to make friends who love me for who I am, flaws and all, that's when I started to become motivated to get better. Of course, I was the only one who could really help myself in the end, and you can avoid that as much as you want, but that avoidance prevents growth and change. It shouldn't have taken multiple near-death experiences to drive me away from my old school. And while I have grace and compassion for my past self, I also want to tell you that you don't have to wait for a rock bottom or feel a sense of permission to make a change, whether big or small. In fact, it's much more effective and a lot easier to make a crucial decision earlier rather than later. Because the anxiety will drive you further and further down a path of all or nothing thinking. I've struggled coping with a lot of different things that have happened in my life within the past few years. And in the past, I developed some really unhealthy coping mechanisms. Avoiding and not accepting the fact that I needed help was one of those. Unfortunately, that avoidance drove me deeper down my hole of misery and turned into self-harming habits that felt impossible to break. 
Sometimes I would do bad things without even thinking about it, and I became so used to hating myself that I thought it would be that way forever. When it comes to breaking those unhealthy habits, there was one thing that helped me the most, thinking about pros and cons. Right now you might be rolling your eyes, and that's okay, but hear me out. It's not just a regular pros and cons list. It's a more thought out one that is made for deciding whether or not to act on an urge. This is what a pros and cons list in DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, looks like. When filling this out, you think about the pros and cons of doing something as well as the pros and cons of not doing something. So here's an example. Say you're invited to a gathering where you don't know everyone and it's making you anxious to the point where you think you're not going to go, but you do some pros and cons instead. So first, the pros and cons of going. You can make new friends, it could be fun, and it could be a step in battling your anxiety. Then the cons of that side, it could be anxiety provoking and you might not have people to talk to all the time. Next, the pros and cons of not going. Pros, you won't feel as anxious and it will feel more comfortable. Cons, you might have FOMO and not going feeds your anxiety. The final step in this process is to think about long-term versus short-term relief or consequences. The goal here is to choose the option that aligns the most with your long-term goals and values. In this case, if you value friendships and connections and your goal is to get over your social anxiety, then you should go to the gathering because it will help your anxieties in the future and chances are you'll meet new people and have a good time, even though it might be uncomfortable at first. Staying home and giving into this anxiety will keep the cycle alive. It feels comfortable in the moment, but in the long term is hurting you. The more you avoid it, the harder it becomes to face it. And you can't live a fulfilling life if your values are not being lived out. Of course, it's not just as simple as deciding to go and do something. In this, I think my best and most concise advice would be to first validate yourself. What I'm feeling makes sense given my situation. Problem solve. What feels most effective in this moment? How can I make it feel less daunting? And then put that plan into action. Things like taking a nap or going on your phone to avoid your feelings, self-harm behaviors, and other unhealthy coping mechanisms may provide you with short-term relief. In those moments, you're distracted, but your problems aren't going away. Ultimately, it will have negative consequences in the long run, and you'll keep driving yourself down the wrong paths. These behaviors are not sustainable, with some even threatening your physical well-being and pure survival. Often, giving into these urges leaves you feeling worse after you feel the small amount of relief or reward. It may be hard to find the motivation to really think about these decisions instead of going with the easiest, most comfortable, or most familiar option, which is totally normal. Humans are creatures of habit. But it is possible to break those cycles. Changing your mindset and using the right skills can make the, affecting co the effective coping mechanisms easier and more appealing to use. This is where things like core beliefs come in. Core beliefs are our most deeply held opinions about ourselves, others, and the world around us. There are both harmful and helpful core beliefs. On the slides, you'll see an example. You might believe that you are unlovable. This is a harmful belief. On the flip side, you might believe that you deserve to be loved. Now I'll give you some more generic examples. On the harmful side, you have everyone hates me, I'm not worthy of living a happy life. No one will ever love me. I'm a failure. It will never get better. I'm not blank enough. Then on the helpful side, you have things like, I deserve to be treated fairly. I'm worthy of a happy life. I'm enough. Others will help me. I can work hard to achieve my goals. I'm strong and capable. And Nicki Minaj is the queen of rap. Your core beliefs inform your reactions to different situations and often unconsciously. If you make a new friend, for example, and you hold the belief that you are unlovable, you might end up isolating yourself or thinking of reasons why this friend might not actually love you. If you do think you deserve to be loved, however, you accept the love from this friend and you embrace it. So obviously, you want to have the helpful core beliefs. But when the harmful ones are held so deeply, it's extremely hard not only to bring them up to the surface, but also to rewire them. It takes a lot of strength, courage, hope, and patience. You have to challenge them over and over again and keep looking for the facts that refute them. And while it gets easier with time, it can still feel uncomfortable and draining at times. Validate that discomfort and exhaustion and let yourself rest, but not quit. 
When I was making a lot of these changes within myself, external motivation led to internal motivation. When I felt supported and encouraged by the people around me, I became more motivated to help myself. External motivation can only go so far, and it's up to you to carry it home. People can force you to do things, and while that may feel like something's happening, real change cannot occur until you yourself have accepted the journey you're embarking on. I often say that the people who love me and the people I love saved my life, which is true, but there's a component missing from that statement. They helped me to save my life. Their love and support helped me to start loving myself, which is ultimately what catalyzed my recovery. I used to think I wasn't worthy of feeling happy or feeling good about myself. In fact, I thought it was impossible that I would ever feel either of those things. And when I believe it couldn't happen, it didn't, and I stayed in my state of agony. When I started to believe that I was capable and strong enough to recover, that's when everything turned around. Earlier, I mentioned the word hope. Going through difficult and stressful times is not as simple as just deciding to flip your world upside down or being motivated. You have to have that hope. And oftentimes, things get worse before they get better. The key to seeing the light at the end of the tunnel is not giving up. Being able to get through and cope with the tough times in order to experience the good ones. There will be ups and downs, highs and lows, and that's normal. Recovery is not linear. If you think one way for so long, it doesn't just go away overnight. When I was in anorexia treatment, one of the therapists would always tell us that your eating disorder didn't develop overnight, so it's not going to go away overnight. Unfortunately, you can't just wake up one morning and decide you're no longer depressed, you don't have anxiety anymore, or you're just going to go ahead and flip your known world upside down. It is long and it is hard, but it is worth it. You always have the power to break yourself out of the cycles that consume you, and in my case, almost killed me. You have the power to be yourself, to step out of your comfort zone, try new things, and much more. Even when it feels impossible to escape, I promise there are ways to make it out of those tough spots. And not only that, but to fully recover from them. I used to hold the core belief that I was a waste of a life and my mental health struggles destroyed all hope of me surviving to the age of 17. I'm 18 in two months. And not only am I finally, not only am I alive, I'm also finally living. Recovering was scary, painful, beautiful, and rewarding. Maintaining a new lifestyle and outlook is equally as important and difficult. So to support my recovery, I came to a brand new school, made new friends, altered the dynamics of my home life, and more. Those things were crucial to what's called my life worth living. Like I said before, I'm alive and I am also living. You can be breathing and your heart can be beating, but that doesn't mean your life is fulfilling your values or goals. So, if you feel like you're just merely surviving, I encourage you to explore the idea of change. Reworking the ways in which I see myself, other people, and the world around me has been one of the greatest blessings in my life. So, if there's one thing I want you to take away from my talk, it's this. You are capable of making your life worth living. You have the power to change things around so you feel happier. You deserve to feel happy, no matter what the voice in your head might tell you. It will be extremely hard, but it'll also be extremely rewarding. Know that you are never alone and that it is okay to ask for and accept help. One year ago today, I was still in the hospital and I had no hope that my life would ever be a happy one. I was still using unhealthy coping mechanisms and I saw no possibility of me being alive to go back to and finish high school. But here I am going against everything I used to believe. I went from hating myself so deeply to loving and accepting myself for who I am. It's not always easy or perfect. There are still hard days, but I can finally say, and without lying, that I'm happy. So please take it from me. I'm living proof that it does and will get better. You just have to believe it yourself. And finally, Frankel, if you're watching this, I hope you're doing well. Thank you.